Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Hutchinson City Council meeting for Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, approve the council agenda. Any agenda additions or corrections? Mayor Council, I don't have any additions or corrections for you tonight. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second it. Motion by Mary, second by Chad to approve the agenda. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Implications from uh, the river at MSP Church. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good Enjoying this warm weather finally, huh? Yes. Thank you. Well, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Council members, mayor, and staff. Father God, we just thank you again for this beautiful weather. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together. Lord, to take care of business. Father God, Lord, that you have uh, placed in our realm of influence. And Lord, we just thank you for your wisdom upon each one of the council members today and the staff. Father God, Lord, that we would be led by your spirit. Lord, we thank you for safety upon all of our workers in the city and throughout the county. Lord, we thank you that you will work through us, Lord, to accomplish your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Recognition of gifts, donations, and community service to the city. Does anybody have anything? Are you ready? Public comment. All right. Uh, approval of minutes. We have the regular meeting minutes of January 25th, 2022. And summary review of the city administrator performance review on of January 25th, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve those minutes. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Dave to approve. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, consent agenda, this will be done with one motion unless somebody pulls something off for discussion. Uh, a is approval of issuing short-term gambling license to the Upper Midwest Elish Chomer Club on July 22nd through the 24th, 2022 at the McLeod County Fairgrounds. B is approval of issuing short-term gambling license to Vineyard United Methodist Church from March 20th. 2022 until August 21st, 2022. Uh, C is issuing temporary liquor license to the Hutchinson JCs on March 12th, 2022 at the McLeod County Fairgrounds. Uh, D is approval mm -hmm. of re resolution number 15420, resolution adopting the McLeod County all hazardous mitigation plan and uh, C is or E I'm sorry uh, is consideration for approval of wastewater lift station control panels and F is claims appropriation and contract payments is there anything that anybody wants pulled off if not entertain a motion so moved second Motion by Pat, second by Dave to approve the consent agenda. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Carried. <laughs> we'll move down to the Hutchinson Fire Department year end report. Yeah, we have our public hearing at 5 o'clock, but we've got a lot of stuff to get through before then, so hopefully we'll have a, it'll go quick enough to get to it at. Five o'clock, so. 
I'm just joking. So. <laughs> this is, one of, those, them, this is one of those moments where I can tell Mike you can actually take your time in giving us your report. So yeah. I actually pause because I'm like, okay, I guess I'm not going to go with it. Mr. Ray, he's smart now. Uh, wait a second. He didn't add anything to the agenda, so... All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, on behalf of the Fire Department, I'd like to present our annual report. Um, I've got hard copies in front of you, and then they were also uh, emailed out in your packets, I believe, uh, earlier or at the end of last week. Um, and please, uh, as we go through this, I'm going to kind of speed through it. I think there's 16 pages, um, but we'll. If you see something, you got a question on something, please ask uh, during, and we'll stop and, and go through it. So. Uh, on the cover, I'd just like to highlight this uh, last year being the 20th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11. Of uh, we had a group um, that worked really hard at our open house to properly um, honor that day. And what's on the cover here is a handmade um, helmet that's an exact replica of that what would have been worn. Um, by some of the firefighters that day. The 343 indicates the 343 firefighters that died that day. Uh, and uh, John Travis, who was one of our firefighters and is also an instructor in the welding department out at Ridgewater, um, he made that and that is an absolute labor of love and the picture doesn't do it justice of how detailed it actually is. So anyway, I just wanted to touch on that. So moving on, uh, page two. I'm not going to read this in detail. I'm just going to hit a couple highlights. Um, our mission statement is very simple, to help people. Um, and, and probably the other piece that's most important there is our guiding principles, the pride, honor, integrity of our firefighters and, and how we function each and every day. A picture there is of our staff this last year. Um, the couple highlights here is... Uh, you know, obviously, and like everybody else is, we're still dealing with some of the lingering effects of the pandemic and how that has um, forced us to make some adjustments and changes in our operations, training, et cetera. Uh, and again, I kind of was hoping by the time this year rolled around, we'd be all done with that. But obviously, we're still in somewhat in the middle of that. So we're still working on that. Things are going well. Uh, but most of this other stuff I'll kind of touch on as we get through here. So one thing I would like to say, uh, we had... Last week, we did this presentation, or I did this presentation along with uh, Matt and Andy were there for our annual township uh, board meeting. Uh, and that's an annual meeting where we go over the year, the previous year, and then work on our budget uh, the previous year summary, and then propose and accept the new budget. So um, that's a good process, it went well. That's about an hour and a half meeting with 30, 40 people there from the different townships. So. Uh, on that note, uh, for you in front of me here today, we'd like to just, on behalf of the department, we appreciate the support that we get from you guys, from the townships we serve, from the citizens of our community. And uh, just so you guys know, we've got a very dedicated group of firefighters and they are ready and willing to perform at the highest levels whenever duty is called. So thank you. Uh, the report is dedicated to two retired firefighters that passed away this past, in 2021. Richard Pop, 28 years of service, and Howard Riggle, 11 years of service. And then our previous year's award winners, we, um, as voted by our firefighters, it's kind of a peer recognition program. Our distinguished service was Tony McAdams, Officer, Officer of the Year, Jason Sturgis, and Firefighter of the Year, Greg Peller. And then just a few of the highlights of some of the special events, but this page in specific uh, is in regards to our open house and the 9-11 uh, tribute that we did that day. And that picture, that's John Travis there holding his helmet. Um, but we had about half of our staff was involved in the weeks coming up to it, getting things prepped. And then uh, about 90% of our staff was there that day uh, for the open house and we had over 700 people there which I think is a combination of two things that's about double what we normally have um, it was a nice September day and I think everybody was tired of being cooped up for the whole year or most of the year and I think people probably wanted to maybe show some appreciation for the 9-11 tribute so 
whatever the reason, it was a good day and we had a great turnout. Um, and I just want to note it on there again, thanks to all, all of our staff that put in a tremendous amount of time to make that uh, an incredible event. Some other quick special events, uh, the Salute to Service Night out at the Tiger football game was a really neat event honoring uh, military, police, fire, ambulance. Uh, the attendance was incredible. Um, and the, the flyover with the air, aircraft was uh, pretty neat as well. So I don't know if how many of you were there, but it was a, it was a very, very neat event. The middle picture there, uh, Firefighter Kirk Undercheck received an award from the city this year um, through the Park and Rec Department. 25 years of coaching uh, the fifth and sixth grade youth football, most of that for the Hutchinson Fire Department team. And I noted this last night in our, in our uh, department meeting, said anybody that's coached and especially those ages, those fifth and sixth grade, to do that for 25 years is an incredible feat. <laughs> uh, Spooky Sprint was another event that we were at uh, with uh, some of our firefighters and uh, family to support the REACH program. Uh, probably the other neat uh, event that we got, were able to get involved in, um, the Min Fire Group is a... Um, entity that is focused on firefighter health and safety across Minnesota. Um, they do a lot of work fundraising and getting resources out there for firefighters. Uh, specific focus or big focus is on cancer reduction and then health, uh, mental health and well-being. Um, Chanhassen, a firefighter from Chanhassen, Doug Foote, um, he pledged to walk across Minnesota 200 miles and that walk brought him right through Hutchinson. He started on the South Dakota border and walked about 35 to 36, 37 miles per day um, down to St. Paul. Um, so in the middle of that, he landed in Hutchinson. And uh, he, at that particular time, that was about day three of the event. And he was uh, had some physical issues with his feet. So we had to shorten his day. Um, and it was pretty neat because we had our firefighters uh, said, well, let's go back and walk the miles that he couldn't walk. So we went back to Cosmos and walked from Cosmos to Hutch to cover the miles that he couldn't walk. And he walked from Hutch to Lester Perry on that particular day, so, or to Silver Lake, sorry, on that particular day. So, But again, it was a neat event, uh, great support from the community. We had a little meet and greet at the fire station that particular day and also in Silver Lake, and that was on the news that night. On, uh, I think it was WCCO had it on when he when he walked into Silver Lake. And just there's a many 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 other events that we're involved in. Probably the biggest one though on this page is the McLeod County Fair. Um, we do all the support for the grandstand events, the fire suppression and EMS, and that's typically basically every night of the fair there's something happening in the grandstand. So we're out there for three, four, five, six hours each of those nights for those events. And we've done that forever. We had a good partnership with the fair. Um, and I, I think uh, that's National Night Out was another good success this year. We try to hit as many of those as we can. Um, I'm gonna keep moving along here. Again, ask or stop me if you got any questions. Uh, ceremonies, we had five of our firefighters that finished, new, newest firefighters that finished all their fire one fire two and EMS training and receive their certificates. And then along with that, they get their, officially get their badges. So we can't, well, we still call them rookies until the next class is hired, but they're technically not rookies anymore. So we put those guys to work. And that's uh, Nick Pagel, Robert Peel, Stephen Olson, Nick Steinhaus, and Jason, uh, Jason Dene. And then just due to some retirements, um, there were some openings and firefighter Chris, Chris Dostel and Eric Enselman, they were both um, pinned as lieutenants to fill those vacant spots from retirements. And then uh, just touching on our retirees, we had three this year in 2021, uh, Lyle Nyabaki, 15 years, Dan Sargent, 20 years, and Tim Peterson, 23 years. Jumping down to page seven, um, some accomplishments. Uh, I'm not gonna go over each one of these, but I think probably the, one of the bigger activities that took a lot of our time in, in this past year has been 
uh, the new tanker truck that's the one on the right on the picture up there um, that was and when we when we get a new truck the way that works with our department anyway and most fire departments we put a committee together they spend usually one to two years prior to actually getting the truck going through specs designing it building it working with the manufacturers um, and then once the process starts then they go down for a couple site visits while the truck is being built just because fire apparatus is pretty mm -hmm unique each build and and we've learned from different years of building trucks that if you don't get heavily involved on the front end of it you have lots of stuff on the back end to to try to fix repair or change so um, we're usually kind of a pain in the butt for the manufacturers and while we're going through it but it's worth it because we get in the end what we believe we get the truck that uh, that we that we wanted that we ordered so anyway this truck came from Midwest Fire down in Laverne, Minnesota. So it's a 3,000 gallon tanker. This is a rural truck only. Um, so it's paid 400% by the rural. And we took delivery of that in September. We decommissioned and sold the other truck, which was a 1990 Chevy 3,000 gallon tanker uh, that went to a small fire department in Iowa. And then the other truck that we're in the middle of building right now is the uh, rescue truck. Um, the chassis is here and the box was just installed on it. That's a pickup side, basically a pickup with a utility box on the back of it. Actually, I think I have a picture on the next page here. Yeah. Um, that's the red truck in the picture. The yellow one is the decommissioned tanker. Um, but that rescue truck is, again, it's a pickup with a utility box on it. That's a grass firefighting rig, a rescue truck, and kind of just a multi-purpose vehicle. And we put that style box on there to give it a little more space so we can actually haul some stuff. That's going to replace just a standard pickup um, that we have, have had for quite a while. Um, Fireman's Park. Um, that's uh, you guys were very helpful in phase two of that uh, contributing to, to complete phase two we're in the fundraising portion of phase three right now uh, much of the equipment f has been ordered and uh, we'll be working on getting the last uh, getting phase three done again the fundraising piece of it and then the final equipment ordered and then we're, the hope is to get that thing done this year now 2022 so keep your fingers crossed and we'll be i'm sure we'll be back here at some point once we get closer to completion of that project hey mike how much is left for that final phase three <clears throat> i mean you know dollar wise what are you looking to raise um i don't know the exact in front of me about i want to say it was about forty three thousand. Is that some close matt i think we had three phases we reach around 40, yeah, forty-five thousand. So. so we've roughly forty forty-five thousand is is phase three that we're working on. So, okay. um, but we've already had some commitments to donate, and uh, we're um, I think the committee's knocking on doors and making some phone calls and and uh, working on fundraising for that last portion of it. So again, we hope to have that complete in twenty twenty two if all goes well. Thank you. Um, we did have, I just, it's noted on here for 2022, we had um, a lot of one-time repairs and serious maintenance uh, on several of the trucks this year, both the city trucks and the rural trucks, uh, which uh, had a negative impact on our budget. Uh, we still did well, but it was just a, a big hit this year for no, no real uh, specific reason. Summer duty crews, we did those from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Those uh, have been very, very well received by our staff, um, and we will um, continue work doing those through the summers. That works very well. Operational data, so we'll get into some of the numbers here. So this is a breakdown of all of our calls. So we had, I'm going to kind of jump to that second table. Can you guys read that okay? Mm -hmm. Mike, could, yeah. could you talk about duty crews? What what actually that is so for people that at home and here understand what the duty crew is so duty crew uh, what we've tried to do is is find 
what works for our staff and what captures times of day and days of week where our call volume is high. Um, so on Friday nights, they do a four hour shift and then Saturdays they do an eight hour shift. Um, and that has, so usually the Friday shift is from um, 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And then the Saturday shift, uh, we've kind of flexed that a little bit, but usually it's about from noon, one o'clock to eight or nine o'clock at night. And what we, so it's a three man crew in an engine all and all the time. So if any, any call that comes in, their response time is, you know, literally immediate. Um, and we had both of the last two years, we've had a little over a dozen calls during those duty crew shifts and we've had car accidents, we've had fires, we've had medicals and, and various other, um, uh, uh, various other calls and what they do is I've got it's worked great for me selfishly because they get a lot of stuff done that I need to have done at the station and some of that's some maintenance on equipment maintenance at the station yes cleaning and then um, and then their the other tasks during the shift is learn something teach something so they go out go to a building or a business or a location maybe they're not very familiar with, get out, walk through, get their own eyeballs on it, kind of pre-plan it. They do some truck operations, they some pump operations, um, get some training value out of it, and then just some camaraderie. And it also helps some of our guys that don't necessarily get on the first truck very often just because geographics, maybe they live uh, a little bit farther from the station or maybe their work doesn't allow them to leave whatever the situation but people that don't have a chance to get in the first truck this is their chance so they're it, you know it helps build their proficiency and just that experience of being in the first truck out on a scene so um, again it's been very well received by our whole staff and and it's it helps the community and it it literally it from a dollars per sec perspective it it cashes out at almost a net zero each year because the calls that come in, we don't page out the fire department for unless it's needed. So instead of 14, 16, 18 firefighters getting paged out, it's just the duty crew, three people on the duty crew take it. And if it's something more serious, they call and ask for an additional page. But because we're not those dozen or so calls a year, uh, we're not paying out the whole fire department or at least the response of those that can that that uh, literally is, is about a net zero each year so that we've done it. Thanks, Mike. Was that longer than you were hoping or short? No, I, I, I just wanted, you know, for people to understand what a duty crew was. All right, so uh, jumping now to the second table on their emergency call totals, we had 498 calls, 318 of those were in the city and 180 were in the rural. Um, and of so of those 498, if you jump up to the top table now, um, the first two columns, fire general and fire structure, um, 57 general fire alarms, that means something, that, something was burning, whether it was uh, car fire, dumpster fire, grass fire, wildland fire, something was on fire and we extinguished it, and 57 of those and then 11 uh, structure fires, so house fires, shed fires, some type of a structure. Rescues and MVA, that's motor vehicle accidents, um, at 81. Uh, and if you look, that number has definitely trended up the last few years. Um, and I would say just recollecting in my head here as we're talking, you know, the last two years, it seems like our car accident volume motor vehicle accident volume has been very high. Um, and if you look, you know, kind of across the state, you've heard that that was one thing with the pandemic. It seemed like people, if it was because there was less people on the roads, people were driving faster or I don't know. I mean, I've heard the state patrol give some of that as possible reasons why. Um, I don't know what, why, but we've definitely had more accidents in the last handful of years than we have. You know, if you look back 10 years ago, we had 30 car accidents the year and, you know, and it's just ramped up to that 70, 80 a year 
Uh, and that's all rescues, that's not just car accidents, but car accidents are a big piece of that. Uh, the next one is medicals, 178 calls. Uh, the medicals, we respond just in our pickup, four personnel in a pickup. And that can range, I'm not, I can't go into details on medicals, obviously, but that is the highest number we've had in quite some time. And looking again across the state at some of the data I see from other fire departments, uh, 21 specifically in, uh, for medicals has been a huge, huge uptick. So even though it's high for us, it's only 20 higher than kind of what I would say is our average, 20, 25, somewhere in there. Um, so we haven't actually seen as big of an uptick as much of the state has in the medicals. The medical calls in general across the state have been crazy high. So, Mike, when there's a 911 call, do you get to the police and you get alerted? Or how do you get called in on something like a medical? Uh, that's a very good question. So the medicals, it's kind of a, it's an interesting across this our county, for instance. So we got eight fire departments in our county, and each one handles medicals differently based on staffing and availability. Um, so in Hutchinson or our district, so in the rural, we go, we're paged out at the same time as the sheriff and uh, Alina for the medicals because there's nobody else coming. A lot of times the deputies, they might be other side of the county. So it's gonna be us and the ambulance. Inside of city limits, it, it um, cardiac stroke trauma, we uh, get paged at the same time as ambulance and police. Um, if it's outside of that scope, usually the police department takes them with a line um, And then there's some various anomalies in between there if all of their staff maybe they might be out on a call and they'll page us etc so it's definitely a kind of a flex sure. model yeah. it varies but that's kind of the core of how it's supposed to work so fire alarms and fire sprinklers uh, 63 calls this is probably the most interesting to me personally because each year that goes by there is more buildings with sprinkler systems, more buildings with fire alarm systems. And the fact, if you jump, jump, jump back 10 years, we were double that number 10 years ago and we probably had half as many systems in place. So I don't know. I don't know why that's happening. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's opposite of what you would think it would be. <laughs> it could be. Uh, then hazardous condition, that is our gas leaks, uh, carbon monoxide calls. Um, a lot of those are handled by our officer only program, which I'll touch on in a minute. And then 48 other and other is almost anything else that doesn't fit in those buckets. But what's inter interesting is that number is literally almost the same every year across the board for the last decade. Those are all cats in the trees. I was going to say that, but I didn't want to. Firefighter, you can't say that. <laughs> hey, thanks for saying that. Um, we don't respond to cats in the trees. That's only in the movies. Um, although I do get called probably once or twice a year with that. And when I say that years ago we had an incident where we... I shouldn't even go into this. <laughs> Actually, you were probably on at that time. <laughs> it was all because of the cat. Gary, I think he was going to do you. I believe Mary... Uh, the Gary, cat not make it, Mike. <laughs> the cat didn't make it. Um, no, where the cat literally like jumped into the bucket where we were trying to save the cat. And um, that was the last time we did a cat rescue because we're like, we're not going to have one of our firefighters get their face clawed off trying to get a cat out of a tree. So I'm sorry if that offends anybody. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, general fires, we touched on that, 68. Uh, firefighter injuries, and this is based on what we have to report for OSHA, what OSHA um, indicates as an injury. So in 2021, we only had one firefighter injured. Um, and that, to note on that one, that was one of the middle of, uh, middle of July, 100 plus degree day, we were helping out uh, Dassel Fire Department on a call just across the, the our jurisdiction border. And there was three firefighters taken in by ambulance that day because of heat exhaustion. So 
that was a crazy event. But um, I think what I want to touch on with that, though, is looking at the work that we do and the times of day we do it, middle of the night, climbing ladders, operating heavy equipment um, in the dark, places you're not familiar with, the fact that we literally typically have one or two, three injuries a year is incredible. So uh, it's a, a testament to our staff and just taking it seriously, taking the safety side of it seriously. And a lot, almost everything we do is in a team of some sort, usually teams of two. And I think that helps as well as far as kind of um, having each other's back there and, and keeping each other safe. So uh, next column is the fire event fatalities. We had two this year. We had one fatality in a house fire and we had one fatality in a car fire. Um, that number historically has always been very low. In fact, we've been on an eight year run of zero, which is a good number. And then one in 2011 and then another seven year run of zero. So let's hope for another seven or eight years of zero uh, in that category. Response time, that's from the time of the page to the first truck out the door, five minutes and 17 seconds. That's staying pretty current or pretty consistent. And then our officer only calls 126 of those 498. So 126 times, there's no big red truck with the lights and sirens on. It's one officer myself or one of the other on-call officers in a red SUV and we show up and we help with a carbon monoxide call or a smoke detector that's beeping or spilled gasoline, spilled whatever, spilled milk, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Not scratch that. Don't pretend no. I should have brought that. <laughs> but um, that program does a lot of stuff for us. It helps, one, it cuts costs. Two, it keeps our firefighters at work, at home, um, because we're not calling the whole department out. And I think it's been well received since we've been doing this by the community because it, you know, when it's something non emergent, they prefer that the big red truck doesn't show up with the lights and sirens. So uh, we try to operate stealth there if we can. But Questions on any of those numbers? Mike, you know, you mentioned it with the rural that surprisingly with how dry it was last year, we did not see a lot of grass fires. I don't know if you want to just touch on that. So. I think uh, that's a good point. We talked about that at our, at our rural meeting and, you know, obviously everybody knows how dry last year was. And I, you know, as we approached midsummer uh, and coming into the fall and especially before harvest, like that last month there of, of summer and into fall before harvest when the fields were just dry mm -hmm. and you know we were just panicked for for a month there on assuming we were going to burn down you know field after field and 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 it just never happened and i think because it was so dry i think in general the the public didn't burn either you know they didn't go out and burn off from tree branches or some crp or i think just all of that was reduced and people just held back. So, um, and I would say as, across at least our county from, from what I heard, um, that was pretty con consistent as well was that we didn't have as many fires as we, as we anticipated we would. All right. A couple, um, of what I consider the most important numbers. Um, and I don't put these in a table because these fluctuate, because of just the calls we go to every year. So there's no value in a pattern to that. I just like to see what happened last year. Um, estimated property value saved 3.7 million. And that is, uh, so if there's a fire, say a fire in a garage, we extinguish it, we save the house. The ho value of the house we saved falls into that category, et cetera. So whatever, whatever we can eliminate or stop the fire and, and the property saved, that's what that estimated number is lives lives saved the most important one up here we had eight saves last year uh, which is the highest we've had since we've been recording it usually it's in that three four five six um, and these are these are real saves these are cpr in progress these are people that are um, in a motor vehicle accident at you know 
knocking on death's door and we cut them out and get them out of the vehicle. And usually we have one or two of our guys that go with them to the hospital, um, events like that. So these are people that are walking around today because of interventions by our staff. Uh, emergency call hours. I, this is the first year I put this in here. I, it was, I thought it was interesting. If you look at it, city calls, so the hour personnel hours, labor hours for all of our city calls was 2,755. And the rural was 3,000. If you go back up to this table and look at our call volume, it's opposite of what our call volume is. So, and what that shows is a lot of the times in the rural, when we have the calls, even though our calls are lower, the duration of the call is typically longer because it's a shed fire, it's a grain bin fire. No offense, Melissa. <laughs> it's a... 3,000 <laughs> 3, or at the Cherokee residence. Um, but those, those events in the rural many times turn into four, five, six hour, eight hour. We even had a multi-day event last year, not yours. <laughs> um, but so that's, and again, that number goes up and down, but just, it depends on, we, we, last year we had quite a few of those calls. Public relations and fire safety education, uh, we ramped up to pretty, pretty close to what I would consider our normal as far as number of events and students. Uh, we had 35 PR events, 561 labor hours, and then we had 16 fire safety education classes or events uh, consuming 80 labor hours, and we had almost 1,700 total students that we taught. And when I say students, that's We've partnered uh, with West Elementary or with the schools, but typically we hit the kindergartners at West Elementary, the second graders at Park Elementary. That's our ones that we do every year. And then that, so that covers, you know, about 500 kids and teachers and staff. And then uh, the rest of that is majority of those are either coming through the fire station for tours or events, or we go out on site to some other, um, other facilities and do classes. So, and when I say student, that's anywhere from, you know, five or six years old to, to 80 years old as well. Do you guys go to daycares at all and do like education events? Um, daycares, we, it's kind of a, here's how we do the daycares. If we say if, uh, if daycare, if like, especially if a firefighter has a kid at a daycare and they have a connection there, um, say so if you want to take a truck to the daycare, go for it. Um, our magic age is about, you know, that preschool age is about the limit. So five to six years old, you know, if you get younger than five, um, it gets pretty difficult to keep their attention and, and actually feel like you're giving them something they can understand. Um, so we really try to focus on uh, for sure, preschool age or higher, but, you know, kindergarten and higher is the second graders are the perfect, honestly. The second graders are perfect age. Um, the kindergartners have been good. And like I said, we, we were cautious with that preschool age because it's just borderline too, too young. And we've had that before. The last thing we want to do is have kids get scared. Because if you get, you get below that and you scare them, we've done nothing, you know. That answer your question. Do, you, do I need to come to your oh, house? My, my two-year-old ended up at an event that a fireman was at, and he wore a little paper fireman hat around the house for like a week. So, and he doesn't talk much, but he had his hat, hat, hat. You know, he kept pointing at it. So he, you touched his life. It's okay. Point, so. Well, that's good. I didn't scare him. That's good. Whoever, whoever. No, it was. he. His favorite Paw Patrol pup is Marshall. So, <laughs> he's all on board with what the fire department's doing. So, there we go. Yeah. You know. Um. One note on that, you know, Park Elementary, so this was our last year at Park Elementary because of the shuffle of the grades and the new Tiger Elementary, the second grade group will be at the new school. So um, we've had a great relationship with uh, Dan Oberg and the staff there at Park Elementary. So that's, uh, that's going to be weird not, not being there because we've been, I've been there for almost every year of my 21 years of existence on the department. So, um, Rental inspections, uh, we, again, we do that kind of hybrid with the building department. Uh, that last year, we kind of maintained that same stance as the previous year from with the pandemic of, of staying out of individual 
living units unless it was needed for fire safety reasons, safety concerns of some sort. We didn't do the traditional um, rental program, rental inspection program. This year we've already started uh, ramping up to more normal numbers, pre-pandemic numbers. Uh, daycare, foster care inspections, I had about 18 of those. Uh, same thing there, I did those as the requests came in from the state or the county. Um, we did not do any, um, on occasion I try to hit a handful of those a year, just uh, go out and do them, but we were, we again tried to stay out of people's individual homes and living areas as much as possible because of, of COVID. And then, uh, Inspections on new, like pre-plans and new buildings. Again, we uh, work with the, the uh, building department on that kind of a hybrid model. We had about 51 of those inspections. And then burn permits. Um, I issue, or we issued 102 of them at the fire station. And this is the last year, 2021 will be the last year of the written permits. The We worked with the county and the McLeod County Association of Townships to get a electronic or a phone-in burn permit system put into place and that actually went into effect this week. So um, that eliminates the paper permits. We don't have to write those anymore. It's a simple phone call to dispatch and the rural people can uh, conduct their burns. So that's a good thing. It's gonna save a lot of time. Hopefully it'll help because it's so easy. People will actually call in um, or more people will call in. And then uh, goals for 2022, I'm not gonna touch on any or all of them. I do just wanna uh, note, we're working right now with McLeod County Sheriff's Office on uh, replacing all of our radio system, our pay, uh, portable radios. Um, they've, they're in the process of doing that with, um, with their law enforcement as well. So that's, a, very large project and where that's going to chew up some time here to get that uh, finalized but they're going to try to utilize i believe some of the arpa funding um, for that process uh, vehicle maintenance I, i'm not going to go over these individually but um, i'm going to actually jump down one table or to the next page or page 13 first just so you kind of understand what, whose equipment is what. The yellow items are uh, city owned only. So our ladder truck, utility five, which is a pickup in the two command vehicles. And one of our trailers is city owned 100%. The two tankers, tanker four and tanker six are rural owned 100%. And then the, uh, how does that show up, orange? Orangish brown color there is the shared vehicles, so 50-50. So when those are replaced, they're a 50-50 cost share. When they're serviced or maintained or anything breaks on them, it's 50-50 on that as well. And you can kind of look. Um, we try to do our best. This is a 15, 20-year estimate. We update it every year on... Uh, when we anticipate the replacement year is for these vehicles, what the original cost is and what we're anticipating for the, for the uh, replacement cost. Um, and we try to stay as accurate as we can on that. We, again, we do some data research every year on figuring out, figuring out those numbers. I think the biggest one, obviously, for everybody in this room is this top one, this ladder truck is getting closer to the end of its 25 year estimated replacement and that is a big ticket item so that'll be consume some conversations in our next fleet meeting i'm sure right matt yeah mike how often does that go out i mean i know we've got obviously there's a requirement with our with the size of our buildings do we have any idea i'm sure we do but how often that actually that ladder trucks goes out for a call so it's a second out truck for all commercial calls of any sort. Um, the uh, actually, if you let's go up one screen here. If you look on the miles and hours, are not you know that thing only gets about four to five hundred miles a year, seventy hours of service, seventy hours of meter time per year. Uh, it's pretty normal. So last year was. 
True. So it's it's not a high volume. No, it's not. But um, it's one of those necessary evils. Sad when you need it, you need it. When you yeah, when you need it, you need it. And I, you know, Mayor, you were around when we used to have our old ladder truck, which was basically a. So the crank one. It was close. You had to wind it up. <laughs> but when you oh, go from seed graves, uh, <laughs> when you go from a stick or just a a conventional like. Ex hydraulic extension ladder basically to a platform a truck with a with a bucket where you can work out of it um you never get me to go away from that just the the workability the usage the safety of having those people inside the bucket 100 feet off the ground um when you're the one that's 100 feet off the ground you appreciate that you're in a bucket and not <laughs> hanging on to the end of a rung of a ladder <laughs> Um, and then I'm not going to, uh, we'll jump, uh, so I'm back up here on page 12, sorry, this is the uh, vehicle maintenance. I, when we had these to the printer, this was something got, I lost 2020 and we didn't catch it till everything was already printed. So, but just to show you last year, last year was a rough year. You know, we had, we did an LED upgrade on the lights on ladder one to get us some, we had some um, issues with some of the lights on there that had to be replaced. But twelve thousand dollars, engine two eleven thousand dollars, our other engine fifty seven hundred dollars. We did a refurb on one of the tankers that was a rural, that twenty four thousand eight hundred sixty. That was a rural project that was paid for um, by them. Uh, as a re again, we had a lot of corrosion and rust issues on one of our tankers, and we had it literally completely taken apart. The cab off of the chassis, the tank off of the chassis and a bunch of the old rusted components cut out, new metal put in and repainted. And so that should get that truck another decade of use is our hope. Um, any questions? I'm not gonna, anything on either one of those last two pages that we just went over that anybody wants clarification on or more info on? Okay. Um, and that's it. The last two pages here, I just got some in-action photos of some of our guys at training or at calls. Um, that one picture, do they know there's a fire behind them? <laughs> <laughs> that is a training house fire that we're doing. <laughs> you know, funny story there, Pat. Um, <laughs> used to, years ago, we used to have a, um, a booth at the fair. And we had, we'd have one truck in there and then we had, we've got like three or four of these pictures at the fire station that are about this big. And we did have those on display, you know, cause from a firefighter perspective, that's a cool picture, right? Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where all these kids would come up and say, don't those guys know that house is on fire? <laughs> Fun said, you know, maybe the perception of that is not what we should be showing the kids. So we, um, yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> well, you say we, we haven't done uh, controlled burns like that in quite some time, so now we won't do another one for a while because... Uh, yeah, we did two last year, the, the the house burn. We we did them for years, and then for the last, geez, probably 12 years, 14 years, we haven't done any. They got very expensive and just difficult to do. Uh some of the rules and, and stuff you had to follow. And now the last couple of years, the state, um, through the state fire marshal's office and the training, the, the fire service training certification board, they've got grants and reimbursements specifically for these. So they've made it now, you know, attainable to actually do them. And so we actually did two last year. Um, we probably won't do two again, because that was one, it's expensive, and two, it's just a logistical monster to pull it off um, but we're going to try to do one a year if we can moving forward as and that's just as they come available it's got to be the right location the right time i mean once they if somebody comes and says yeah i got a house i want to burn it takes several months to get it scheduled get it laid out there's stuff that's got to be tested um inspected etc so it's not as simple as just uh We've got some burn containers out at our training site and we, we burn in them fairly frequently and we can do that. You know, we can decide on a Monday that, hey, let's, we're going to burn tonight and we can go out and do that with 
little to no setup where these are these are hard so they're great events but they're a lot of work to pull them off is it usually just a house in the country that somebody is going to tear down anyway usually sure. yes sure so we can't use it for the corner of second over here <laughs> i've had a few people ask me about that one no that one's I'm not gonna burn <laughs> a hard no that's a hard no <laughs> that would be so do, melissa do you recognize those bins there <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions, comments? Otherwise, I'll let uh, let you guys go. I appreciate your time. So, Mike, you you made a statement at the at the rural meeting that uh, now that you've been on for twenty one years, finally all the trucks are red. <laughs> and when I was on during my time, they went from red to yellow. <laughs> so. At the end of in my like end of my career, they were all yellow, yeah. but now Mike's got them all red again. So. Well, if it, I'll, and I've got some of the age issue too because everything was yellow when I started. Yeah. So I've seen <laughs> the whole fleet transition. You know, that first year that I was on, first two years I was on, we had three to three trucks: the ladder truck, a rescue truck, and a pickup. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we had three trucks that were red. It was like, oh, geez, I thought we were yellow. You know, so. <laughs> I'm Is there sure a reason for either or just personal preference of whoever's in charge? You know, years ago, yellow was, they were, they were either two colors typically, red or yellow. And yellow was considered a safer color because it was more visible. Pre, you know, if you go back, the lighting wasn't very good on the trucks. And, you know, in the last 10 years with the LED technology and how bright, I mean, anybody that's been on an accident scene or a fire scene, I mean, the, the lighting is crazy bright. So... The color of the truck doesn't matter anymore, and it's always funny when I we get you know calendars dropped off at the fire station from all the manufacturers all the time, and you flip through there, and there's green ones and blue ones and orange ones and white ones and black ones, and so yeah, there's there's definitely no consistency there anymore. But red's they're, still the most prominent. Fires are still red though, usually. Yes, <laughs> they are. They are. I like the red. I do too. <laughs> Oh, well, the LED lights, you can probably see them three miles away now, can't you? Yeah, and they, you know, now they're starting to finally put uh, like day-night options on those lights yeah. uh, or like a dimmer option on those lights. So they're just starting to transition to that, which in my opinion, they should have done that a while ago. Because at night, they're, especially on a, on a roadway or car accident scene, I mean, it's almost blinding how crazy bright they are. So Plus, the, what, 3M? did all the reflective on the back of all of them too now. Yeah, we've got that Chevron, the red and white striping on the back of all the trucks now. And uh, that's that's huge in the road, especially, you know, that's even, that's as important as the lights, honestly, from the roadway safety perspective. Anything else for Mike? He's got five minutes to burn yet. Yeah, we still got one new business set up. Oh, address. <laughs> All right. All right, Mike, you're out. You're out. <laughs> All right. Hey, but thank you for filling thank, that gap. Thank you. No. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Good job. Take thank care. You. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate the support you guys give us. Mm -hmm. You go back and you tell your staff and all those people that work in that fire department a huge thanks from every one of us because they definitely keep our city safe. Mm -hmm. Will do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Uh, no unfinished business. New business. Uh, amendments to the city of Hutchinson COVID-19 preparedness plan. Um, yep, yeah, Mayor and Council, it's actually... I think been some time since this policy was shared with the council. It was back when we were in, um, I think, emergency status. Um, but with some of the changes that have come out from um, CDC, Department of Health, we thought it was appropriate to update um, our policy. And, and more or less what this does is kind of help us in regards to how we deal with staff um, that may become sick with, with COVID and um, basically the, to keep the workplace safe. And so a lot of these um, standards follow what's been recommended by the CDC and the Department of Health. And um, I'll be honest, we've kind of even pared them back a little bit to, to what some of those original recommendations were. But I think 
And we presented this, presented this to the department of directors, got some feedback from them, and I think staff is comfortable with what we've put in front of you for consideration tonight and asking you to consider approving this, uh, this plan. I'd make a motion to approve. I'll second. Motion by Chad, second by Mary to approve. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, governance, uh, we have the library board minutes from November 22nd, 2021. Economic Development Authority Board minutes from January 5th, 2022, and the Hutchinson Financial Report and Investment Report for December 21st, 2021. Mary, you've got five minutes, so if you wanted to do some staff updates, updates, you can attempt to tackle that. Don't have nothing else for us, Mike? No? Not at this time, no. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mark. I can burn up a couple seconds. Okay. <laughs> Nothing else tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Cool. Dave. <laughs> Me? Yeah, you, Dave. All right, I'll, I'll catch up to you. Okay. Uh, really nothing Mary. To, uh, to report. Thank you. Sounds good. Mary? I have nothing. It's been quiet. Mm. Can I? Yeah. I have nothing either, so get out and vote if you haven't. Yeah, thank you. Mr. May. Not till 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, with the nice weather, we talked about this before the meeting. Yeah. Be careful walking tomorrow. We'll be slippery as heck with all the ice and the water out there that will refreeze. <laughs> yeah. People of my age have to be cognizant of that. <laughs> <laughs> Throw your back out. You don't, you don't bounce as good as you oh, used to. Well, I still bounce, but it's just <laughs> it's flat. <laughs> it's flat. Yeah. Matt, do you have anything? Um, just one minor thing, just a reminder that uh, city offices will be closed on Monday, February 21st for the President's Day holiday. That's the day before our next uh, council meeting. That's really the only thing for me. So, they have school that day. Do you? I, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Present today, they don't. Oh, they they have in the past. I don't remember. I haven't looked at the calendar yet. So, Are you sure? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think they do. They but... might. So they may or may not. So <laughs> <laughs> spring breaks the next week. Fifty so. fifty. So, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't remember. All right. The only thing I had is, I, I know I, I kind of say it a few times, but uh, make sure that uh, if you get a phone call and you think it's suspicious, make sure you contact the police or one of your relatives or children, whatever. Just, um, I know there are scams going around again, so I feel feel bad for somebody that gets taken in and loses a lot of money, so. Um, Otherwise, it's 4.58, we could have Elise Mouse begin um, presenting the there public hearing item. We have so. public hearing modification to the development program for the development district number four and creation of the tax increment financing plan for the establishment of a TIF district for Number four dash twenty two. Okay, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Um, I got a short little presentation here about the project, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, basically, the agenda is just to consider establishment of a of a tax increment financing district, and I'll talk a little bit later about what that is in more detail. Um, the project is the redevelopment of the Jorgensen Hotel. And as you know, I mean, this was built um, over 100 years ago now, 1916. And it's 22,000 square feet on the three floors. And um, really not much has happened with the building, with the exception of the first floor. I guess the first floor has been redeveloped, but the upper two floors, nothing's really happened since the 1970s. So the upper, upper two thirds of the building, it's pretty blighted. 
and um, nothing is really going on or hasn't been going on for quite a number of decades. Um, we have a developer um, who is interested in redeveloping the property. It'll be almost a six million dollar project and they're going to put on a new roof, um, put in an elevator, new windows, uh, do tuck pointing on the exterior and then build out the interior and the, the idea is to make it back into a hotel. It's going to be an upscale hotel. It'll probably be the nicest hotel within 50 miles I would say. So um, you know more upscale I would say. $200 a night rooms is what they're thinking about. Um, I got a few pictures of the interior of it as it is now. So this is on the third floor and then you can see the existing roof of the building, the ceiling there. Um, let's just say deferred maintenance, I guess, would be it. So um, definitely it looks a little, little bit um, worse for wear. So still some leftovers there from the early uh, 1970s. Um, the original rooms that were there were hacked out, um, gosh, I don't know if it was a decade ago when they did that. So here's a view of one of the interior stairways, uh, windows. This is the front of the building. So to the left outside those windows would be Main Street. And this is on the third floor again. Uh, this is, I think, second floor. You can look out the windows and in the last window to the right, you can probably make out part of the State Theater. Um, this is just looking the opposite direction. And this is the south wall next to, I think, Cook's uh, Jewelry Store. So building is obviously in very rough shape. So what we're proposing is that we would uh, implement a, a tax increment financing district. And that's just a public finance tool that can provide resources just to help get projects over the hump and make it, make it doable for the developer. So this would be a redevelopment project uh, a redevelopment TIF district with the goal of removing blight. So just for folks watching at home, um, and always a good reminder, how does tax increment financing work? And so really it starts off, every, every property pays property taxes. And in the case of the hotel, the Jorgensen Hotel, the estimated market value of that building as it is today is a little bit more than $570,000. And then the property taxes that they pay today is a little bit more than twenty-one thousand. So, if a, when a TIF district is put in place, that original tax amount that's frozen in place, and that gets divided up between the city and the county and the school. So, those tax dollars will will continue to go to the city, the county, and the school at the exact same levels going forward, even with the new TIF district. So then we set up the new TIF district, the project gets done, the building is improved, the estimated market value goes up as a result, the property taxes that it pays goes up as a result, so we have new tax value created, and then those dollars help pay for the improvements, right? So the, the owner of the property, the developer of the property, they're just gonna pay this increased property taxes, and then that new value gets redirected back into the project. So the original property tax amounts, they continue to go to the city, to the county, to the school district, same as always. And it's only the increase that mostly goes back to the developer. And they use that to pay for the improvements that are needed. So miles of tax on it was like 21.7 or something, 22. Correct. And that would continue to be paid the new value. Right, yep. Yep, just that'll, that'll, purposes, that goes back into it. Yeah, let's say the, the new taxes, and we have no clue. I'm just right. trying to, let's say it's 40000 yep. So that $19,000 difference goes back into the, the development. Gotcha. Um, you know, and so people ask, well, what does that do to the, the city's tax rate? Somewhat nothing. It, 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 doesn't, de it doesn't decrease. The tax rate doesn't decrease because you don't have that new value that's coming on for a, a number of years. Um, like we talk about, and I think Hutchinson prides ourselves on this, 
we make decisions that's not looking at just today or tomorrow or next week. It's really looking 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And that's really where you'll see the large benefit. The, the initial benefit is you're improving a building right now that's going to end up providing a service to the community. In the long run, that will go back to paying more taxes in the, in the community. But for a period of time, we're providing a, a benefit that that I think, in our opinion, helps both the community and the developer. So. Correct. Yep. Um, and then once the TIF district, the TIF district is set in place for a number of years. And so then the, the TIF district will fall off. So the benefits to the community are that the property is going to get redeveloped on the front end. And then on the back end, there will be new tax base. And then the higher amount of the tax value, that gets divvied up to the city, the county, the school district. So everybody gets a raise at the end. Um, and um, I think a key point that everybody needs to understand is that there's no public tax dollars that are going into the project. It's only the developer who's paying his property taxes. That's what's going back into the project. And without doing the TIF district, there's no redevelopment. There's no increase in the tax value. So, I mean, really it costs us nothing, but we benefit because we get the property redeveloped. And then at the end of the TIF district, all the jurisdictions are gonna see a bump in their, in their uh, tax revenue, theoretically. Um, any questions about that so far? I know it's, it's kind of a complicated topic, but everybody's good. Um, we, uh, we did our due diligence here in, in uh, getting ready for this. Originally, we had intended to bring this to council in uh, December, but then we had to do more due diligence. So um, back in November or October even, I think we did an eligibility study just to document that the property meets the legal definition of blight. So that's included in your packet. And that basically it's just a write-up of all the deficiencies that I showed you pictures of. And then the second part of the due diligence is what's called a gap analysis. So we have the city's financial advisors look at the developer's pro forma, their budget, and just to make sure that public assistance is genuinely needed to make the project happen. So, um, and Ellers, I'll just, the summary that, uh, that we got from Ellers, and this just came out just last week, says Ellers concludes that the proposed development may not reasonably be expected to occur solely through private investment in the reasonably near future. And I think that's borne out by just what we've seen. I mean, we've been waiting to get this redeveloped for 50 years. So it's obvious it's not going to happen unless there's some sort of a push in the form of public assistance uh, with this TIF district. And then also, um, um, you know, we take a look at the developer and it's, it's Brian Forcier is the developer. He's got a, a redevelopment company called Titanium Partners. He's based up in Duluth. Same guy that did Cobblestonian Hotel. So we've worked with him in the past and he's very, very good to work with. And um, he's got a ton of experience with redevelopment projects. He's done a bunch of these up in Duluth. So he, on the one side, he's got the experience, and then on the other side, he's got the resources to really do it the right way. So these are just some of his projects that he did up in Duluth. So we know he's legit, um, and he's been very good to work with. I think Cobblestone Inn, that worked out real nice, and we're convinced that the Jorgensen project is going to work out real nice as well. What is that building in the left? Uh, oh, oh, gosh, I couldn't tell you. It used to be a bank. It says Duluth National Bank. Sure. Huh. Looks like I'm not sure what it's used for now. <clears throat> I don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't know what it is today. I wonder where it is in Duluth. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. So what we're proposing is a, is a redevelopment TIF district. And over the course of the life of the district, the district runs for 25 years. Over that whole time, about $600,000, a little bit more of tax increment would be generated. That would work out to about $23,000 per year that would go back into the project. And that works out to just a shade more than 10% of the project cost. So we want to find the right balance. Um, and I think we're in a good place with that. So, I mean, we're just putting in enough just to make the thing work uh, from a budget side. 
and then um, we have to talk about business subsidies. This is Minnesota statute that we have to go over. There's like eight different things that we have to talk about. So I'm just going to run through those and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. So the public purpose is to enhance the economic diversity of the city, ultimately to increase the tax base of the community, the measurable, specific, tangible goals, um, no job creation. That's not the goal. Our goal is to get that property redeveloped. And, you know, if we get that developed as a 24 room hotel, that's going to have huge positive impacts on downtown Hutchinson. The people that stay there are going to more than likely spend some money in town. They're going to go eat somewhere. They're going to go get coffee somewhere. They're going to buy gas somewhere. They might walk, they might go see a movie at the state theater. So it's going to bring a lot of activity into our downtown. It's going to reinforce our businesses up and down Main Street. Um, financial obligation, if the goals are not met, well, they would have to repay the, the assistance plus interest. So, um, statement of why the subsidy is needed. Basically, it's just to make the project economically feasible for the developer to undertake. Um, as I stated before, I mean, we've been waiting 50 years for some redevelopment to happen. It has not happened because it just doesn't pencil out uh, from a business perspective for people to be doing this. So that's why it needs a little bit of a push in terms of this assistance. Um, the person doing the project, they got to commit to continue operations for five years. So we just get a letter from them. Name and address of parent corporation, there's none. Um, it'll be Titanium Partners that does the project, but they don't have a parent. And then list of all financial assistance by all grantors um, proposed. We haven't really brought this to the Economic Development Authority yet, but I'm assuming there would be a downtown loan We'll do a facade improvement grant. We'll do a sign on on grant. So it'd be those things that would go in to help make the project happen as well. So um, the EDA board has talked about this in depth and they are recommending approval to the city council. And um, what's being requested tonight would be approval of two resolutions. The first one would be just to establish the TIF district. And then the second resolution is just to set up an inner fund loan where we borrow from one fund to just pay the setup costs of the TIF district. I don't think we'll need it. It's more of a just in case kind of a thing. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Where, so I, I'm glad to see someone, I mean, come in and develop that thing. I think it's a good job. Is parking an issue, you know, where will they be able to use like behind Main Street and that type of stuff? Is that, that's a city? Um, yeah, they yeah, the developer has looked at that and we're fortunate that there is some city parking on the back side of that same block and then there's a big parking lot just kitty corner across Washington um, where the old city hall used to stand. Yeah. Um, and I think from the developer's end of it, um, their perception is that'll be adequate. That plus the fact that they're sort of... Uh, they might be a little, well, I don't know if I can even say that. I was going to say it's kind of counter cyclical in that it's busy during the day and not as busy at night, whereas the hotel will be busy at night. So they'll be filling in at I'm night. They're going to like drop off and, you know, people checking in and then. Right. Stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think the developers looked at that and really the, the distance that anybody would walk wouldn't be any difference than what they do at, for example, the cobblestone. You got to park in the parking lot and you walk. 50 yards or whatever, so. Hey, Miles, I have a question for you. Yes. You always talk about them doing the two floors, right? The top two floors. Yes, yep. Um, what's going to be going on in the basement of that building? Um, they haven't really told me what that's about. I mean, what, what uh, the developer told me is that they want to put 24 rooms in there, so that's going to be the top two floors and then a portion of the ground floor um, I, I, he hasn't really told me anything about what's going to happen with the basement. Okay. So I know they'll put in an elevator. So the, and the elevator will go down in the basement. So I'm assuming they'll, at a minimum, there'll be an equipment room down there. But beyond that, I just don't know. Okay. I'm assuming the laundry and so forth would probably go in there and things like that work out. Okay. Thanks. I think it's a great idea. I mean, we're, it's, I don't look at it as some people might look at it and go, well, you know, 
it's a handout. I look at it as it's a hand up from our city helping them out so we can get this redeveloped mm -hmm. and make it work within our city. And like you said, we haven't had anyone look at this building for redevelopment forever. So it's good. Yep. And, and, you know, just to be clear, I guess, and to reiterate, I mean, it's really the developer that's paying it. We're just allowing them to, to recoup it. Right. Yeah, to recoup his property tax bill right. a little bit. And so, there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. What's the estimated uh, time of construction? Well, I think um, if we get, if uh, the city council says go ahead tonight, um, I think they're going to get architectural plans put together right away, and then probably by this fall, some activity would start. It's going to take time to line up oh, sure. contractors and so forth. and. It'll be really interesting to see what materials prices are because that is just murder yeah. these days. Um, so, yeah. But I think they've got a huge amount of experience doing this. So, I mean, they're as best equipped as anybody to handle all the details that go into these things. But I would figure by the fall, we'll see okay. construction going on. Have you seen, a, have they given you like an architectural drawing of their concept or? Um, no, I haven't seen anything. I mean, the exterior would be just the same. Yeah. yeah. You know, they'll just freshen it up, I think. So, um, but no, I haven't seen anything in terms of what the rooms would look like or anything. Anything else for Miles? Oh. Open it up for public comment. Motion that closed the so moves. Another okay. sellout and crowd, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Motion by Chad, second by to close the public hearing. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we have two resolutions underneath there. Uh, resolution number 15383, resolution approving the modification of the Development program for the development district number four and creation of tech instrument financing plan for the establishment of a district number four dash 22 and uh, resolution number 15384 resolution approving the terms of a $30,000 tax increment interfund loan. In connection with TIF district number four dash twenty two. I'll make a motion to approve both of them. I'll second. Motion by Chad, second by Mary to approve both resolutions. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thanks, Miles. All right, thank you. With that, we can adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Pat to adjourn. Paper say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye.